practice would be easy if the problems of the mind were neat and orderly and fit into nice categories and came in nice graduated ways, starting first with the easy problems and then moving up to the harder ones and then the still harder ones. That way the practice could be neat and orderly as well. It could start out with virtue. Once virtue was perfected, then you could focus on concentration, and then when concentration was perfected, you could focus on discernment. It'd all be very nice and systematic. The problem is the mind is not systematic. It's chaos. You know, we all know that chaos has patterns to it, but the patterns are very complex, which means that you have to be ready for anything at any time. Sometimes very difficult problems get thrown up to at you before you're ready, really ready to handle the easy ones. So when you're working on virtue, concentration, and discernment, they all have to come together. You have to be ready to use whatever tools you need when they're needed. And oftentimes you find that you have to start out with discernment. That faculty that we're told that comes at the end. I remember feeling frustrated back when I was staying in Thailand when John Fu would keep saying, well, use your banya. That's the Pali word. It's also the Thai word for discernment. Well, those were back in the days when the only translation I knew, knew for banya was wisdom. And I kept thinking, how am I going to use my wisdom when I don't have any? But he's talking about a faculty that we all have. We all have discernment to some extent or another. Then you have to put it to use all the time while you're practicing. You put it to use while you're observing the precepts. You put it to use while you're practicing concentration. In other words, in terms of the precepts, there are times when you put in a difficult position where it's really hard to keep to the precepts that you've promised yourself you're going to hold to. <coughs> Sometimes you're asked a question and you don't want to answer it for one reason or another, and of course you can't lie. So the question is, how are you going to use your discernment to get around that situation? How are you going to use your discernment in order to maintain your precepts even when it gets difficult? And the same practice in concentration. You have to use a certain amount of discernment just to get the mind to settle down. Figure out which object you're going to focus on, how you're going to deal with the breath, which kind of breath. Sensations are the ones you should focus on, which are the ones you should let go, which are the ones you've got to change. At what point you have to stop changing and just sort of let things be so the mind can really settle down. All of this requires a certain <laughs> level of discernment. And then there are other outside issues that come in as well. Because as the mind begins to settle down, you start <coughs> running into things that are, look like they're lying in wait for you. Sometimes the issues may be just recent stuff, things that happened today or yesterday. Other things may things be things that go back a long ways. Sometimes you find issues from your childhood suddenly coming up to the surface of the mind. After all, there's less activity on the surface, which allows things that are deeper down in the water to come floating up. And the issue there is how can you deal with those things in a way that doesn't destroy your practice, doesn't get you off the path? Sometimes you can just remind yourself, okay, I'm not ready for that particular issue yet, and put it aside. Other times it keeps coming back, coming back, coming back. And you've got to deal with it in some way or another. And you can't wait until your powers of concentration are fully developed before you can turn on it, because it's right there, <coughs> breathing down your neck. So your first line of defense is to try to figure out, okay, this question that's coming up, how do the Four Noble Truths apply to it? This is the Buddha's basic term of analysis for just about everything that comes into the mind. These are the terms of appropriate attention. When an issue comes up, try to figure out where it lies on that, on that field. Is it an issue of suffering? Is it an issue of craving? Those are usually where the issues lie. It's very rarely an issue of the path or the cessation of suffering. 
Okay, when it's suffering, what do you do with it? What's your duty? Well, the duty is to analyze it. How do you analyze it? Well, don't take it back psychologically, or in the terms of psychoanalysis. Just analyze what's happening right in the present. Where is the suffering right in the present? What kind of suffering is it? Where is the physical side? Where is the mental side? Sometimes you can deal with the physical side just by breathing through it. It makes it a lot easier to deal with the mental side. And wherever there is suffering, there is bound to be craving as well. Look for that. There is bound to be clinging as well. Look for the clinging. The clinging is something you want to analyze. The craving is something you want to learn to let go. And it may not be the case that you can get all the way through the problem in one session, but at least you've got the proper approach to it. You're learning to step back from it and not identify with the problem as my problem or as that I'm suffering in there. Just look at where is the suffering, where is the problem, where is the craving. When you can see the issues from this point of view, then they're a lot easier to deal with. And even though you can't work totally through the issue, at least you're headed in the right direction. In other words, you take whatever discernment you've got and you put it to use. It's like going down to the gym. You go down because you want a nice strong body. Well, where are you going to get that strong body? Well, you take the weak body you've got and you put it to work. And that's where the strong body comes from. Now, you can't wait until you've completed your course at the gym when the body's really strong before you come out and deal with physical work outside. You take whatever body you've got, whatever strength you've got, and you apply it to the work. And whether the work gets done totally and completely and with a lot of finesse, or at least it gets done enough to pass by, the fact that you're using the qualities you have, you're using the strength you have, that's what builds your strength for the next time around. Because oftentimes these issues are going to come back again, but at least if you can learn how to deal with it enough to clear a little space in the mind, that allows you some time and some space to get back to your concentration. In other words, the issue may be a huge tangle of things. You're able to untangle one little bit. When you untangle that, things loosen up in the mind a little bit. And when they loosen up there, you've got your opportunity to get back to your concentration practice. Don't be complacent. Don't think that as you're drifting along through the day and things are nice and easy, that they're going to be nice and easy all the time. Sometimes huge issues suddenly come bubbling up under the mind. Remember the word fermentation? Asava that lie down there, they can come bubbling up at any time. The potential is always there. So when things are easy, when things are going well, make the most of the opportunity to practice concentration, strengthen the mind, strengthen your mindfulness, strengthen your alertness. So that when the issues finally do present themselves to you, you've got something to fight them with. Because the issue of discernment is, on its own, can't deal with them. The discernment needs a strength that comes from concentration, comes from mindfulness and alertness, comes from your conviction and the principle of karma. All those, the five strengths, conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, discernment, they all have to work together. Because otherwise your discernment will just start analyzing things and get further and further away from it. That's what's actually happening in the mind. That's not the kind of analysis you want. You want to keep coming back. What's happening right here, what, right now? What are you experiencing right here, right now? Keep the present your frame of reference. Even though the issue may be dealing with something that happened in the past, try to remem remember, okay, your experience of the past right now is happening in the present. Keep that point in mind as you're dealing with that, whatever the issue is that is coming up in the mind. Then you find that it's a lot easier to pull yourself out, to deal with the issue as you can, to create some space. So it's not ho hogging your whole attention, it's not consuming the mind. This is very important because we, as I said, we can't wait until concentration is totally 
master before we have to deal with these issues. We're going to have to deal with these issues all along. And our purpose is to create some space so that we can continue our practicing. Don't get upset if the issue keeps coming back in the times between when it comes back. Okay, that's your time to practice straight concentration. When the issues come back, okay, you take what concentration you've got, what discernment you can develop out of that concentration and deal with the issue, get it out of the way again. Ultimately, there will come a time when these issues get cut at the root. But up until that time, you just have to keep learning how to live with them, learning how to keep them at bay. You know they're there. The trick is so they don't come and totally overcome you. I mean, if you really could sit down, you could think of all the things to worry about. There's every, lots of stuff to worry about in this world. You could spend your whole day worrying about this, worrying about that. Death could come at any time. Your death, death of people in your family, death of other people, all over. It's there just waiting to happen. And yet, why is it that we're able to live without being consumed by that fear? It shows that the mind has practiced, at least to some extent, in being selective in what it focuses on, what it doesn't focus on. We'll learn to use that capacity to create a little compartment for your practice here. Learn how to protect that compartment. It's going to be one of the weakest parts of your mind for a long time, because it's, it's new. Other concerns have gotten themselves entrenched in the mind. They're really good at calling for your attention, demanding your attention, saying, this has to be dealt with right now. And as for the practice, it keeps getting nudged out of the way, pushed out of the way. Well, your desire for pra to practice, your desire to develop the qualities you need in the mind, that has to learn how to be vocal too, how to be strong as well, so that it can make room for itself and push a lot of these less vital issues out of the way. That's what this comes down to, is that when you're practicing, it's not neat like in the textbooks. The textbooks talk about, okay, and then there's this stage, and then there's that stage, and then there's that one, and finally you get to the very end. It's like going to school. You go from first grade up to twelfth grade, and then four years of college, and you're done. But you find the state of your mind as you're actually practicing goes up and down, up and down all the time. And you have to deal with all kinds of different problems. So you use what virtue, concentration, discernment you have to deal with things as they come willy-nilly for the purpose of making more space for yourself to practice. Now, in the course of this, both doing the straight practice and then dealing with whatever distractions come up, learning how to sidestep them, learning how to figure out where the jugular is on some of them so you can just get rid of them. And other times you just say, okay, I can't really take care of this one yet, but I can push it out of the way for the time being. That also develops your virtue, your concentration, and your discernment as well. So if you take the right attitude to these distractions, they're all part of the practice, too. They're the things that come to test you. It's one of the reasons why monks go out into the forest. They hear about mindfulness, they hear about heedfulness, they hear about concentration and discernment. Well, see what it's like when you go out in the forest and you're the only thing to hold on to, when you've got all those animals around you and all these potentials for danger. You might starve tomorrow, maybe someone might not put food in your bowl. All sorts of things are totally out of your control. What do you have to hold on to? Virtue, concentration, and discernment. Get the mind into concentration so it's not overwhelmed by worries. The dangers are still as they're out there as they were before, but you learn how to turn them off. You begin to realize that the whole problem is not the dangers out there, it's the fact that your mind is totally out of control. When you can bring it under control, you find that you've, learned, you've developed a really important skill. And the word mindfulness takes on new meaning. Concentration, discernment, heedfulness, these all take on new meaning once you've learned to use them in this way. So 
So you see, as you get into the practice, it's not like a textbook. You can learn all the words, but they don't have the same meaning as they do when you've learned how to put them into practice and drawn on whatever resources you have. When events come and you say, well, I'm not ready to deal with this one yet, but it's right there. You've got to deal with it. What are you going to do? If you're up for that kind of challenge, then the practice really goes well. It really does become an adventure in the mind.